Hebrews 11 verse 21. By faith Jacob when he was dying blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. <coughs> As you know we've been studying Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, the series is titled Living by Faith. Wonderful faith lessons drawn from the lives of the Old Testament saints. But the author is teaching the New Testament people about faith using the Old Testament saints. We looked at the story of Abraham, long passage from 8 to 19 verses. And then last week we looked at Isaac and how Isaac operated in faith. And today we're going to look at Jacob and how by faith Jacob when he was dying blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff <clears throat> now <clears throat> before we really get into this uh, matter of how he blessed the sons of Jacob which is the main part of the sermon here today we need to take a look at this first line where it says when he was dying this is in dying moments of jacob's life this is happening jacob's story is a long story just like abraham's story in the in the book of genesis the story of abraham takes up about 12 chapters of genesis the story of jacob also takes equal number of chapters it's a long long story but the author of the book of hebrews does not bring up any other part of his story other than this one part where he blessed Joseph's sons. This happens right at the end of his life when he's 147 years old and about to die. He does this one act of blessing Joseph's sons and he brings only this thing to highlight Jacob's faith. That's very interesting. He could have talked about Jacob's birth, the way he was born. He could have talked about how you know he was a supplanter cunning crafty fellow from the beginning and what all he did in uh, buying the birthright uh, that belonged to the oldest son in the family for so cheap just a pot of pottage and then he cheated him out of his uh, blessing by deceiving his father stole literally his blessing and ran away with it to his uncle's place and lived there 20 years married his two daughters it's a great big epic saga you know <laughs> it's a story to be told many movies can be made out of this whole story and very interesting story indeed many things happened and on the way back after 20 years of his life spent in his uncle's place and having married his two daughters he comes now on the way back to meet esau and uh, there he meets with god himself and and literally wrestles with god and comes out as a changed person transformed person jacob turned into israel his life is full of faith experiences experiences where he has learned a lot of things made a lot of corrections changed a lot and so on but the author of the book of hebrews takes into account none of those things he comes to the very end of jacob's life and talks about the very last act that he does the act of blessing his sons why because in the dying moments is when jacob's faith began to shine the most literally because he was not such a good person to begin with he was a difficult person he was a trickster and he was he had a lot of tricks up his sleeve you know and and and, and he's a he's a cheater and conniver and, and, and a person who deceived and so on. He had his own plans and his own strategies and he depended upon his own wisdom and, and strength and, and, and so on, cunning craftiness and so on. He was that kind of a person. Even though he's in the plan of God, God has chosen him. There are some good things about him. He's not like his brother Esau who did not regard, you know, as anything, the blessing and the privileges that were given to him. he disregarded all these things but jacob had a great respect for these things so there were some plus points about him but there was a lot of minus you know if you had to make a selection based on 
whether he's a good person or not, I think you would have left out Jacob, you know, because he's not a good candidate. But God chose this guy because God is confident that he can change this guy and make a new person out of him and use him mightily for his glory. So God took charge and, and used him and, and, and so on. And the last part of his life is where his faith shines greatest. Now that tells me, that, uh, that, is, uh, that leads me now to talk about the dying moments of a believer. You know, uh, God is glorified very much even in that way that a believer dies and the way he concludes his life on this earth. It's a wonderful story that illustrates the fact of how even in the dying moments you can glorify God. You know, here is a man that has gone through a lot of change, but now he dies by honoring God, by his patience, by his hope, by the witness he leaves behind of the truth of God's word and the excellency of God's ways. He's a witness and a testimony to who God is and how great a God he is. What a wonderful God he is and so on. Now, not only Jacob, God gives us three examples in the the author of the book of Hebrews comes up by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us three examples. In verse 20, he talks about Isaac and he also in his dying moments only blessed Jacob and there we have another dying moment story. And 21, we have Jacob, here is another dying moment story. And then in the next verse, Joseph will come to next week, we'll talk about how Joseph in his dying moments glorified God and acted in faith and showed what uh, uh, showed and reflected some of the tr great truths about God. Now, <clears throat> these three examples are wonderful. The Bible says in chapter, uh, Psalm 37, verse 37, mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace. Have you ever read that? Mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Have you ever noticed that the Bible makes much about the end of a person's life? And talking about Job, the New Testament says, consider the end of Job. Why not the beginning of Job? There's a lot of mess up in the beginning. Job himself talks a lot, which he regrets later on. He says, I'll shut up. I have spoken things that are too wonderful for me, things that I never understood never comprehended, too much for me, but I have uttered my words and I'm sorry, I will shut up and he lets God speak. Now he shut up, but a lot of people are still speaking what he spoke in the first few chapters, you know. A lot of Christians are stuck with the first few chapters of Job. But the Bible, New Testament, specifically draws a lesson from Job and says, consider the end of Job. Consider how he finished it, how he finished his life. Not only about Job, there is a verse in the next chapter, in Hebrews chapter 13, if I read to you from verse 5, the later part of verse 5, it says, For he himself has said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow." considering the outcome of their conduct. You know, it's telling us to remember those who rule over us, the ones who have spoken the word of God to us, follow their faith, considering the outcome of their conduct, considering their end literally. You know, we read in the Tamil Bible, it literally says, consider the end, how they ended. The Bible says in the book of Job, your beginning shall be maybe very small, but your end will be very great. <clears throat> Always our beginning is very small. It's insignificant. It's full of trouble, full of confusion, problem, difficulties. But how you end your life, by the time you end, it must be, you know, something. You must have learned something. You must have come to some conclusions. You must have learned how to exercise faith. You must have really learned a lot in life and you must be able to show forth the glory of God in and through your life with all that you learn. 
Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, with believers it may rain in the morning, he said, thunder at midday and pour torrents in the afternoon, but it must clear up before the sun go down. <laughs> in other words, he says, towards the end of their life, you know, through their life it may be a lot of storms, a lot of rain, a lot of flood and all that. But towards the end, they enter, by the time they enter heaven, they have really smoothly made it because though their life was filled with many clouds and darkness, and many hours of their life were spent in some difficulties, they come to an end which is glorious, which is fantastic. So that is why we need to consider Jacob when he was dying. You know, faith is like this. Faith is not like the shining of the sun on a calm and clear day. It's not like the sun is shining and nothing to resist it. And the sun meets no resistance from the atmosphere. It's not like that. Faith is more like the sun rising upon a foggy morning. Its rays is struggling to pierce through and dispel the opposing mists. It's struggling to get through. Mist is covering. There is fog. Mist. The sun is shining, but it's not able to get through. But I tell you, if you wait a little longer and if you exercise some patience, if you wait, the sun will indeed eventually get through. The fog will be dispelled. The covering of the fog will be gone. The gloom will be gone. The mist will be gone. The rays of the sun will pierce through and will shine upon the earth, make everything grow and blossom. Faith is like that. We experience faith in that way. Many times we have opposing situations, problems, difficulties. It's like a fog over our life. You don't see any scope. You don't see any answers. You don't see any future. It looks like all difficulty and more difficulty than ever. But the sun is shining. You just can't see it. The sun is shining and it's going to shine harder and harder. The power of faith is like that. It never gives up. It shines until eventually the fog is dispelled. I tell you, if you're going through problems, difficulties, challenges, that you're facing today, I'll tell you, my friend, by faith and patience, our forefathers obtained that which was promised. Just wait a little longer. Just give it some time. Let God do his work. Let faith always look up to God. And I'll tell you, faith will eventually win the battle and in the end, it will be always glorious. You know, that is why the Bible always tells us to see the end. So towards the end, Jacob's life is a, cha is a changed person. He had too much trust on him. He struggled. He made things happen. He did things on his own. He had ideas. He had strategies. But in the end, you will see him completely trusting God. For example, remember in the end when Jacob, Joseph is in Egypt and... Uh, <clears throat> The brothers had met Joseph, but Joseph retains Simeon there and tells them to go get Benjamin and come back because he wants to see his brother. They were born both to the, they were both born to the same mother. So he's fond of him, says, go get Benjamin. And uh, so they come back. Simeon is now sitting there in Joseph's place. They're not able to tell their father that it's Joseph there because they told him he died, you know. Jacob thinks he's dead. Now they have to tell the father to let Benjamin go with them. Otherwise, they can't get Simeon. They got to go back. They got to go back with Benjamin. And uh, Jacob, I'm sure, it was another foggy day in his life. It is another day when, you know, he's feeling all the bad things. You know, last time I sent Joseph with you guys, you never came back with him. And uh, you said he got killed. But what are you going to do with my Benjamin? I, like, I love him. Next to Joseph, this is my most beloved son, you're going to take him and come back and tell me all, all kinds of things going on in his mind. But that is not what he spoke when he opened his mouth and spoke. No more his personal strategy, cunningness, craftiness, nothing. He said, 
may god almighty grant you favor in the eyes of that man joseph is talking about when you take benjamin may god almighty grant you favor in the eyes of that man he now believes in god's favor he is tired of his cunning craftiness he is through with all that he is no more using that he says may god almighty give you favor in the eyes of that man sitting over there and when you come back may you bring benjamin and simeon for me <laughs> he remembered god almighty where did he get that from you remember in chapter 17 of genesis in verse 2 god appeared to abraham it's one of the great appearances of god to abraham and says to him abraham i am the almighty god i am el shaddai walk before me and be upright and i will increase you greatly god said so god almighty had spoken to abraham and abraham had conveyed this event this uh, thing that happened in his life that almighty god the god who gave him a child at 99 years of age the god who made things impossible possible the god who fed him through the famine days and made him rich in the midst of the famine the god who delivered his enemies into his hands the god who's always done him good god almighty he must have shared with his family and when god appeared to isaac he spoke to him in that same way he said is god almighty you know and uh, isaac blessed jacob in the same way may god almighty bless you he said but jacob did not cling to this god almighty for many years jacob jacob always had his own ideas he believed in his ability to swing things his way he did not leave it to god to do something he always did things himself he had faith in what he could do for himself but now in his old age he says may god almighty give you favor he now believes in god's favor he believes that god is with him he has come to the conclusion without god's favor he could not come up in life could not have come up in life without god's favor he could not have crossed all those mountains of his life he could without god's favor he could not have freed himself from laban and come here you now when he went to laban that was a tough that was a tough life when he escaped from his brother and ran away to laban he worked for 7 years because he liked, liked laban's daughter his uncle's daughter he wanted to marry her so laban said all right will get you married to her in 7 years he worked and then finally the marriage was arranged lo and behold the marriage was held in a dim light situation i think the guy couldn't even see who the girl was and it so happened he found out later on that it was the older girl that he did not like that didn't look so good to him so he went back to his father and i said what is this you've done you've given me the wrong girl and the father just look at the kind of crook he was coolly says don't worry i'll give you the second girl also he got the job done you know got the first one married says i'll give you the second one also work for me seven years and this this guy works seven more years that's what is called love <laughs> see we give you extra lessons here seven <laughs> seven more years he works <laughs> and after 7 years finally he gets married 14 years to get this girl my goodness i mean that's that's what you get paid for your strategy and your cunning craftiness and all that that's what you end up doing 14 years if he had just allowed god to work and did not deceive his brother and did not steal the blessing he would have stayed with his father and lived comfortably and everything would have been fine would have been fine and god would have given him the blessing anyway because god has chosen him but because he took the shortcut because he decided that he will make things happen he's in trouble already 14 years wasted with all his brilliant mind working schemes and strategies nothing is working out a lot of people's lives are like that because they don't trust in god they trust in their own brilliance and their mind making things happen finally after 14 years he wants to leave because he got the girl he wanted thinking about his father's house wants to leave and uh, aben must have been an indian i think he makes sure that this guy ha- doesn't have anything in hand see when you don't have money to even travel you won't leave you see that's a good way to keep a man on the job you know uh, so 
in india they do it they keep one month salary or something like that they make sure that you don't have enough to leave and go look for anything else all this is a indian tricks you know and uh, so we have decided that he will keep him high and dry <laughs> he will will keep his pocket empty that will fix him he'll stay here he won't have he won't even think about going if he doesn't have money to leave and go so laban's strategy works but god of heaven looks at jacob whom he has chosen is merciful to him and jacob says to his wife one day he says your father changed my salary 10 times just imagine father in law as a boss is a tough thing sometimes changed his salary 10 times he says but my god the god of abraham and isaac my four fathers took from your father father's wealth and gave it to me in the end what happened he had more flock than ever became very rich so that 20 years later when he left laban he could leave in two dividing his assets into two because if he went on the road with everything that he's got you know every thief will be there to rob from him you know it was such a big crowd of cattle and servants and so on so he has gone through a lot he has experienced a lot and finally he has learned faith he has learned no 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 don't trust in your cunning craftiness trust in god he learned in that incidents where god gave him took from laban and gave him made him wealthy in spite of all that laban was doing against him god made him wealthy against all odds god blessed him he says that jacob says that god blessed me literally he came to the conclusion none of my strategy worked cunning craftiness worked but god's grace has made me what i am and there on the way he meets god and he was totally changed and completely transformed so that when he comes to egypt finally where his son was he finds that joseph his son is still alive and they bring him to egypt remember and joseph in 47th chapter of genesis in verse 7 he presents his father jacob before pharaoh pharaoh is the number one king in the world he is the king of a superpower he takes his father he is the number two man joseph is the number two man in the whole nation in the whole world so to speak and he takes his father before the king to present him before the king and jacob did not stand there like a beggar before him he stood there and the bible says jacob blessed pharaoh here was a man that had such dignity with shoulders high knowing who he is he now knows that no circumstance in life can put him down that nobody can even shake a finger against him that no man can damage him no man can kill him no man can destroy him no man can derail the blessings that god has pronounced upon him he knows that he is in god's plan that god has got a purpose he is not afraid of any man he's got great sense of dignity and a healthy pride of who he is and stands before pharaoh and blesses the greatest king on the earth at the time he was showing that he is the child of the king of kings he is in covenant with the king of kings and he is there as a representative of the king of kings and the lord of lords so i told all of this to tell you what a great transformation he's gone through he is not the cunning crafty cheap fellow that he was like before he's a very dignified man man who has learned a lot about god his faith has worked he has understood what faith can do faith in god can do and now he's going to bless his son the whole event of blessing his son is found in genesis chapter 20 i mean 48 and i'm going to have to read a long passage there if you don't mind but it's good for those of you who are new to the bible you know i don't assume anything you know you know now tamil service is also there's a lot of people that are newly reading the bible so i don't want to assume that everybody knows this story thoroughly i, w- I want to read it it's a very interesting story So let me read to you from verse 1 all the way to verse 20 all right Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told indeed your father is sick and he took with him his two sons 
Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Now, jo Joseph must have told the people there, you know, if daddy gets really, really bad, you know, if he's getting old, if he looks like he's going to die, inform me, I'll come and see him. So they've informed him and he's coming. And the man who's laying down, very old, sits up on his bed, wants to meet his son, the prime minister of Egypt. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Can Canaan. Luz is the same place as Bethel. And blessed me, tells the story, uh, what things happened. See, in the dying moments, here is a grand old man, dying man, giving a testimony, giving a witness of the goodness of God, how God's word is true, how God is a good God, that those who trust in this God will never fail. That's what he wants to convey in his dying moment. His body is weak, his eyes are dim, but he wants to testify about God. This is the way to die, my friends. He says, he said, to, he said to me, God appeared to me and said to me, he says, Behold, I will, take, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. So he's got that vision. This is one thing good about Jacob. Esau never appreciated these things. But Jacob appreciated God's purposes. Even though he used the cunning craftiness to achieve ends, but he appreciated God's purposes, respected God's purposes. So he tells the story of how God appeared to him and promised him that God will make them a multitude of people and give this land to the descendants as an everlasting possession. And verse 5, And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring... Whom you beget after them shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I, come from, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When he looks at Joseph, Joseph is Rachel's son, you see. He remembers his wife the wife that he loved most. And his memory, you know, goes back to his wife and how she died and tells his son, her son, how the mother died and how he buried her and so, and so on. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given, to, given me in this place. And he said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. He says, I never thought I'll see you, but I'm seeing your sons also. What a blessing. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face on the earth, to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim his, with his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh, with his left hand towards Israel's right hand and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly. Some translations say, guiding his hands wisely. Very good translations. He knew full well what he was doing. Knowingly, he crosses his hands and puts the right hand on the younger and the left hand on the older. The right hand contains the greater blessing. It must go to the older. But he does the, exactly the opposite. Puts the right hand on the younger and the left hand on the older. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and left his hand uh, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, God who has fed me all the way, all, all my life, uh, long, uh, long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name be named upon them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. <clears throat> now, and Joseph saw 
that his father laid his right hand on the head of the Ephraim. It displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not so my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand in his head. But his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, by Israel you'll bless, saying, by you Israel will bless, saying, make God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. That means it says that they're going to bless in the future, saying, may God bless you or make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. He put Ephraim first, the younger first. The younger name is mentioned first. When people bless in future, he says, when Israel blesses, they'll bless saying, may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh deliberately puts the younger man's, younger boy's name first and the older second. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. He gave supremacy to Ephraim over Manasseh. Very interesting stories. Story. Amazing event here. Now look at the blessing of Joseph's sons. Because that is what Hebrews 11, 21 is talking about. By faith, in his dying days, Jacob blessed Joseph's sons. And leaning upon his staff, he worshipped God. So, in his blessing the sons of Joseph, he expressed faith. In other words, the author of the book of Hebrews believes that you can see Jacob's faith in demonstration towards the end of his life. And particularly in this one event, in the blessing of Joseph's sons. You can see jo Jacob's faith. Now, how do we see it? We look at the blessing. There you will see Jacob's faith. The blessing is found in verse 15 and 16. There are three parts to the blessing. The first part of the blessing is a prayer. Let me read it to you again. Verse 15, he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. This is the way he blessed Joseph. This priest speaking the blessing over the lads, over the kids. He says, God whom my forefathers Abraham and Isaac worship, uh, walked. God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who has fed me all my life long to this day. The angel who redeemed me from all evil. He mentions three things. Why he mentions three things is very interesting. Mentions three things. Let's consider the three, three things first. One, he says, the God whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, before whom my father, Abraham and Isaac, walked. He could have simply blessed the kids, say blessings, you know. But he, he puts the blessing in a certain way. The God before whom my forefathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked. In other words, he's the living God. There is no God on earth. This is the living God. This is the God he has who has chosen Abraham and Isaac and him. And uh, his forefathers have walked before this God, have come to know this God. They have had a relationship with God. They have a covenant with this God. And before this God, they have walked. And they are carrying out his purposes and plans for their lives. They are here on this earth on a mission. Placed there by God, blessed there by God. That is all, he brings everything in there. God who, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. I never forget a sermon <laughs> preached many years ago when I was a student. I heard this sermon about why God is called the Abraham, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob by Oral Roberts. And I have never heard anything like that at that time. Why God is called the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. I never thought about it. All my life I've heard Christian people pray in India saying, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. But I never thought why God is called the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 
when he mentions the god before whom my forefathers walked he is talking about the kind of god that he is he is introducing jacob's joseph's kids to the god whom abraham knew and isaac knew and now he has come to know and experience what kind of a god is he the god of abraham isaac and jacob he is a god who calls you into a relationship with him he is a covenant keeping god we just sang just now covenant keeper miracle worker promise keeper you can call him all these names he is that god the world has never known god like that they have known gods who asked them to bring this and that the money and the gold and the silver and demanded all kinds of things demanded them to fast and demanded them to come to this place and that place and do this and that for them gods it demanded always from human beings here is a god who never demanded anything <laughs> like that he is not asking anything from people here is a god who has his eyes on people because he has made them he loves them he respects them they have fallen into sin he loves them he reaches out to them the whole covenant that god made with abraham and isaac and jacob these people is about redemption is about how to bring them back to himself this is an unusual god this god is ready to give his own son one day on the cross of calvary to die as a sacrifice for mankind amazing god the world has never heard about this kind of a god the god who not only calls you to a relationship and a covenant fellowship covenant relationship but a god who feeds you takes care of you all through your life he mentions that he is a god who takes care of you all through your life he meets all your earthly needs other people belittle earthly needs but you should see the prayer requests i get all the time you know prayer requests mostly are about earthly needs <laughs> people have a lot of needs they are in a they are in a heap of problems and it's usually just four or five things it's family problem financial problem health problem you know happiness problem this kind of problem it's all the same you know you do you read 100 requests it's all the same they're not happy family problem husband is not right wife is not right relationship is broken separated family broken job gone no income debts sickness this is this is the problem and uh, Abraham, jacob says my god is the god of abraham and isaac he is not only a god who calls and says come and follow me i am the true and the living god but what will this god do for you he will take care of you he will feed you in the midst of famine he will cause you to be rich he will help you overcome famines he will raise you up from the heaps of poverty so that you will not be immersed in your poverty he will raise you up cause you to rise from those difficult circumstances he is that kind of a god all that comes in he is a god also who redeemed me from all evil he says he is referring to god as the angel who redeemed me from all evil that is also his experience not only is the god who calls him to salvation the god who reveals himself true living god is a god who can speak he can reach out he's got a heart he's got love he reaches out to people calls people called abraham isaac and jacob he's a god who meets every need because he cares about your earthly needs he knows your problems he knows that you're unhappy he knows that you're suffering he knows what you're going through he knows and he can when man came to jesus saying if you can heal me if you're willing you no if you not if you can he knows that he can but he say his doubt was whether he will if you will you heal me are you willing to heal me he said jesus looked at him without delaying any 
his answer. Surely and certainly he said to him, I will and you be made clean. God's will is that you be healed. God's will is that you be delivered. God's will is that you don't hunger for food. God's will is that your earthly needs are met. God's will is that you get delivered from the debts. God's will is that you be blessed. This is God's will. God is willing. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But not only that, he's a God who delivers you from all evil. Abraham had that experience, went against four kings with household servants and defeated them. Recovered everything that was lost. Won the battle, war. Isaac experienced the same thing. People were against him, chasing him off because his wells were bringing water while their wells were not having any water. They saw that he was blessed and he reaped a hundredfold in famine, in the midst of famine. But in the end, they were not just jealous, they were afraid of him because they knew that God was with him. That's why his wells have water. And the king of that place in that place, in that foreign country he lived, came to Isaac and made a covenant for his protection. He didn't want Isaac to turn against him. He made a covenant with him to protect himself because he was afraid. He said, I hear, I hear that God is with you. What a testimony. You think I, Jacob has not heard these stories? He himself has experienced. He himself has had enemies was afraid of Laban, that Laban is going to eat him alive, take everything that he's got and leave him empty. And on his way back to meet his brother, he was afraid that his brother is going to kill him. Or thieves and robbers will kill him on the way. He divided his assets into two. But God saved him, kept him from all those dangers and harm. Arrived safely. He was always afraid of his life because his brother was intent on murdering him. He didn't know when he will die, but he didn't die. He's now 147 years old. He's standing up tall. His shoulders are high. He now believes there's no use worrying. <laughs> All the worry is a waste of time. All the fretting and worrying was a waste of time. He now knows that God has a purpose and until that purpose is fulfilled, no man can lay hands on him. Nobody can do anything. He believes in God's destiny and God's power to save him and keep him. So he says, may the angel who protected me from all evil, redeem me from all evil, bless the lads. May the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me, met all my needs on this earth, the God who Redeem me from all evil. May that God bless the lads. Why is he saying, may that God bless the lads? In other words, it is a way of saying, may that God give the same kind of protection, give the same kind of meeting earthly needs, give the same kind of covenant to these kids and undergird them with his strength and cover them, protect them, feed them, take care of them and bless them. May everything that has happened to my forefather Abraham, Isaac and me happen to these kids. May they be blessed just like I am. That's the prayer, the first part. The second part is a formal adoption that happens here. In verse 16, he says, Let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. Now, this is very important because the kids were born in Egypt. They had an Egyptian mother. So, he wants to make sure the kids don't revert to that culture and that philosophy and that kind of worship and that kind of thing. Don't identify with that culture and don't become part of that culture even though the mother is from that culture. He wants to make sure that they become the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, children of the Most High God, covenant people, he wants to make sure that they identify with God's people. So he says, let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. 
<laughs> let these kids be known as the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Let them come in that thing. Forget about that Egyptian origin. <laughs> let them not revert to that. Because in that there is no blessing, there is no covenant. In that there is nothing good. In that you may have a temporary earthly exaltation. Jacob, uh, Joseph was in a very high position. Second in command in the whole country, maybe in the whole world. Because it was a superpower. But that was all just temporary that had to do with just a few years of life on this earth. But the covenant that God had with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the covenant which belongs to these kids, is not just for a few years. It is for generation to generation. It is an everlasting covenant. He wants them to know the difference between the two. So that they will never take pride in the fact that their mother is from Egypt and this superpower country and this great country of Egypt. So that they will never identify with that culture, with the worship, with the, all the practices there. He wants the kids to take pride in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He wants the kids to realize who this God is. What a great and mighty God this is. And what an amazing covenant this is. This is an everlasting covenant. And promises of this covenant is going to be fulfilled for many ages to come. For thousands of years more. Because the promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob did not involve just, promise to Abraham did not involve just the birth of Isaac. Not a promise about birth of Isaac. It is a promise about birth of Jesus through Isaac in the lineage of Isaac. So when Isaac was born, only part of the promise was fulfilled. The best part is yet to be fulfilled. 2,000 years later, Abraham didn't even see it. Isaac or Jacob never saw it. 2,000 years later, they died in faith, it says, Bible says. Verse 13 says, they all died in faith. Died believing it. Died believing that God who gave Isaac will also bring about that seed, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will become the savior of the world. And as savior of the world, he will be preached among heathen people, among all the Gentiles, Gentile nations, and people will come to accept him as Lord and savior. And they all, by faith, will become the children of Abraham. And in this way, only the promise to Abraham can be fulfilled, that he will become the father of many nations. That was never fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. He never became father of many nations in his lifetime. They never even became a nation in, their, in his lifetime. Not even the nation of Israel came about. So it was a long-term promise. So <laughs> Jacob <coughs> doesn't want these kids to be short-sighted and look at Pharaoh's house and the palace and, and their wonderful bungalows they may have and, and all the comfort and all the conveniences and the privileges and the stuff they had and lose out on the blessing of Abraham. Abraham's blessing is greater. <laughs> Amen. It's far better, far greater. It reaches to ever. It's, a, it's an everlasting covenant. Therefore, he wants to make sure that the kids belong to the family of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, become covenant people. He says, let my name and the name of my God Father Abraham and Isaac be placed on these children. Let them be known as their children, he says. But look at verse 5 in chapter 48. The adoption. We're talking about the adoption. Now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He says, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt. See, they were born before Jacob ever came there. Joseph was there as a slave, then became a prime minister, and then got married, got children, before he got connected back again with his family. So the kids who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. He mentions two of his actual original sons. Reuben is the oldest son. Just like Reuben and Simeon are my sons, your children will be my 
sons. He inducts them in the family, gives them a legal adoption status. He literally declares them as his own sons. Uh, if I ask you how many tribes Israel had, you will say 12. Well, actually it's 13. Because 12, ch- 12 sons of Jacob makes 12 tribes. But in the place of Jake, Joseph, God gave Joseph's share to two of his sons. So Jacob actually got a double blessing, <laughs> double portion. So the tribes became 13 tribes actually. 11 without Joseph, plus two sons of Jacob. In the place of Jacob, two now. So 13. But it again became 12 because Levi's did not have a portion in the promised land. They did not have any uh, uh, possessions given to them. Therefore, it became 12. So you just need to understand uh, this. So what has happened is a legal adoption, bringing these two sons into the family, legal adoption. And uh, now the children are heirs. The children are heirs to everything. They belong to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They will not be considered foreigners. They will not be considered outside of the covenant. They are his children, he says, and gives them the portion that belongs to Jacob and really inducts them into the family. All right? Now, the third thing is the blessing of a great posterity. In verse 16, in the last sentence it says, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. That's part of the blessing. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now, this is not a new promise. This is the old promise. When God called Abraham, he said, I'll make you a great nation. That's exactly the same promise. When God spoke to Abraham in chapter 15, verse 5, when Abraham was lamenting about he doesn't have a child and his servant is going to break all his property, Abraham said, God said, no, no, you're, you will have son. And you will have descendants like the stars of the sky, he said. It's the same promise. Chapter 17, when God appears to him, says, I'm El Shaddai, the almighty God. Walk before me and I will increase you greatly, he says. That's the same promise. In chapter 22, Mount Moriah and what happened there. God was very pleased about the whole outcome that Abraham would take his son, was ready to literally offer his son as a sacrifice. God was so pleased with him. So God again pronounces the blessings that he had already pronounced the blessing. In chapter 2 at the end, God again goes through the whole thing and most emphatically pronounces the blessing because he was so happy about Abraham. And in that he says, I'll make you make your uh, a great nation. Very emphatically he says that. So in the blessing that is pronounced on Joseph's son, two things happen there. One is Joseph, through this blessing, Joseph has been given the double portion, the birthright privileges that belonged actually in the family to Reuben. Reuben was the eldest kid. It must have gone to Reuben. The firstborn has doubled the property, spiritual authority over the family, becomes the teacher and the guide of the family and so on. It's a very big blessing. Birthright that belonged to the oldest child is very important. God takes it and gives it to Joseph in the the place of Reuben. The reason is that Reuben misbehaved. He did something very dirty, very bad. And I don't want to go into that now. And because of that, he is excluded. And Joseph receives the blessing. But the other thing is very interesting. That is, between Manasseh and Ephraim, God takes what belongs to Manasseh as the older and gives it to Ephraim. Now, this is most interesting. I can understand why God took it away from Reuben and gave it to Joseph. Because Reuben is an unworthy fellow. He's a He's got a curse upon him, literally, because of what he did. But what about Manasseh and Ephraim? Bible nowhere mentions that Ephraim is better than Manasseh, that there was something lacking in Manasseh. Nothing. 
no difference is mentioned between manasseh and ephraim then why should he take what belonged to manasseh rightfully as the older kid and give it to ephraim <clears throat> there is no indication anywhere in the bible that jacob may have had a heart of favor towards ephraim very specially like esau like like in the case of isaac who had who liked esau because of all the meat that he hunted and brought he had a liking he wanted to bless him it was not the situation like that there was no inclination like that but it's an interesting story it so happened that when blessing joseph brings the two sons we read joseph brings the two sons and aligns them because his father is not able to see well his eyes are dim he al- aligns them in a proper way he puts the older son in front of his right hand and the younger son in front of his left hand and jacob wisely or knowingly the bible says i pointed out that to you, that to you knowingly he crosses his hands and blesses the old the older with the left hand and the younger with the right hand the greater blessing no reason is given god has put ephraim ahead of manasseh transferred the rights of the firstborn to him it looks like for no reason at all but there is a reason i pointed out to you last week also a little bit about how we must understand the old testament in light of the new testament Joseph did not like that because he realizes that his father has done wrong. Instead of blessing the older son with the right hand, he is blessing the younger son. So he tells his father, he says, Father, you know, it displeased him. So he says to the father, you know, he took, a, took the hand of his father and puts it on, removes it from Ephraim's head and brings it to Manasseh's head, the right hand. He wants the right hand to come upon Manasseh's head. correct the situation but joseph says to the father uh, joseph said to and joseph said to his father not so my father verse 18 for this one is the first born put your right hand on his head here is the prime minister of egypt standing there <coughs> telling the old man the father father he says father not so please take your right hand and put it on the older son manasseh is here right in front of you to your right put it on your oldest son but his father refused and said listen to the answer of joseph he says jacob he says i know my son i know i know my son i know even though the prime minister is telling him jacob would not budge <laughs> he says son i know and he mentions i know twice so i know i know and all i can think of we can remember how we cheated isa out of the blessing and stole it and regretted it and all you can think of was how when it happened isaac was astonished and feared because he realized god had brought together his purposes in an amazing way he says no i'm not going to make the mistake just because you tell me as the prime minister you better listen to me i know god's plan i will not change it i've gone through this whole life making mistakes trying to make things happen let me do it god's way this is god's way i'm putting my right hand on the younger and the left hand on the older because this is god's plan god's plan is going to come to pass that is why the bible says by faith it displaces faith against all odds no pressure from man isaac uh, isaac was pressured by his flesh in a fleshly way he liked his older son because he brought him meat hunting you know there's a carnal attachment because he liked the meat he brought here here is the pressure from a son son who is in a great power son because of whom the whole family has found refuge good things have happened to them 
if you're going to oblige anybody, you're going to oblige this guy. Joseph is standing and saying, put your hand, right hand on Manasseh. He says, no, I know my son. I don't want to do it. I'll do only God wants what God wants. So by faith, he sees, foresees everything. He sees that this fellow will become great. So he tells him, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people, referring to the older one. And he also shall be great. Yeah, he'll also be blessed. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his descendants, notice this, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. That particular promise, descendants becoming multitude of nations, is a messianic promise. Abraham could never become a father of many nations without Jesus being born as a descendant of Abraham, then becoming the savior of the world. And everybody who believes in Jesus, by faith they become the children of Abraham. So Abraham today is the father of many nations. Only in that way you can become father of many nations. The father of many nations blessing, he says, belongs only to Ephraim. Yeah, in other ways, he'll be blessed. Yeah, yeah, he'll have all the earthly blessings and, you know, whatever, you know, that was part of Abraham's blessing. That part he will have. But this messianic blessing to be a forefather of the coming Messiah, to become the father of many nations, that is granted to this guy. God is specifying the line. <laughs> How many of you understand what I'm talking about? All right, let me just say this and close. Why all the time in the Bible we find in the Old Testament especially, even in the New Testament, we have the story of the older and the younger brother. Remember the prodigal son story? Younger is preferred. <laughs> because everyone is looking at the older and the older signifies the qualified one. The older, by tradition, is qualified to receive the double blessing. So, whenever you talked about the birthright, they said older. Yeah, he's the older. The second, no, no, he's not qualified. The third one, fourth, no, they're not qualified. The older. Just imagine how these fellows would have felt, you know. The first guy, first guy gets double. <laughs> the rest of them <laughs> get the rest. That's the way it was. They're not the preferred ones. They're not the wanted ones. They're not the ones that were so blessed. They felt like the ones that are left out, I guess. Not wanted. Why did God select always those second ones, the younger ones? Because God wanted to teach grace. God wanted to teach grace. Look at how the world looks at the blessings of God. The world says, he's a good man, so he must be blessed. Right? The other day one man was saying, people like these, these people are being blessed, brother. What are you talking about? I said, that's why you're not receiving the blessing. Because you are the biggest Pharisee, you think that you are so holy, so good, that if any blessing should come, it should come to you, not to this rascal, you know, here. <laughs> But God says, I want that guy only. Because only when I bless him, I'm glorified. I don't want these proud, arrogant people that say, I deserve the blessing. If anybody deserves it in this city, I deserve it. God says, it doesn't work like that. God's grace does not. There is no place for boasting in God. Absolutely no place for boasting. Grace is taught like that. Christianity is a grace way. What is grace way? What is the difference between the teaching of grace and the teaching of the law? Or the, the works? Works is the right word to use. What is the grace way and what is the works way? The works way says, if you went to a works church, have you been to a works church? If you went to a works church, the whole gesture, everything will be different, you know. If you behave, and if you don't do anything wrong, God may bless you. That's the preaching. If you behave, you do all the things right, you do this and this and that, then God will bless you. 
Now, a lot of people don't see any problem with it. But that's not the Christian teaching. What is Christian teaching? Christian teaching says, God has blessed you, therefore behave. Hello. How can you receive so much blessing from God and behave in such a bad way? That's a thankless guy that does it. If you, God has blessed you in such a way, then behave. Genesis 1 itself, grace starts. As far as I'm concerned, it's not grace, it's not a New Testament subject. In Genesis, before man was even born, man was even made, God prepared everything for man and put everything that man would need. Made a list and created everything. Then finally only made man. Just imagine what would happen if God created man and said, let's see how he behaves. You know, If he's holy, I'll bless him. He didn't do it. It's grace, man. He just made everything that everything in abundance and plenty. There's gold in the land, four rivers for one man, thousands of fruit bearing trees, abundance everywhere that he sees, no lack, no want. Christians would have objected today. They would have given a big lecture to God on what a waste it is. But God said, Well, I want to make sure that there is nothing lacking. <laughs> I'm going to give the greatest honor to man, make him in my image and likeness and put him there. He's going to be my child. I'm going to provide for him the best way possible. God provider. So he must live well. So God provides everything. And then tells him, you may eat of all the fruits of all the trees. Freely eat. That means feel free. That's what he's saying. Because... If there was a Christian church there, they would have told him, don't eat everything. <laughs> Only two fruit a day. He said, freely eat. Eat whatever you like. But of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. The day you eat thereof, you will die. Eat everything, but just don't eat this because the day you eat thereof, you will die. <laughs> In Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God. Let me, I've been preaching in Tamil in the first one. So I just all of a sudden, I got to switch here. Let me uh, read it to you, 818. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish the covenant which he sold to your fathers as it is this day. God has already blessed them. That's why he says, as it is this day. You already got it. God has already made you wealthy and well and blessed you in so many ways. Remember the Lord your God. He's the one that gave you the power to get wealth and he established his covenant, that he may establish his covenant which he sold to your fathers. He didn't bless you because he liked you or he, you are just such a wonderful holy person. He blessed you because he said he will bless. Because he's promised Abraham, he blessed you, he says. Then he says, then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify you this day that you shall surely perish. Exact same commandment like in the Garden of Eden. There he said, after giving everything, if you eat of this one tree, you'll be dead man. Here he says, Remember your God who gave you all these things. If you don't remember and go after other things, then you will perish. Exactly the same command. Right? So Christianity is about grace. Please understand grace. We are people of grace. We enjoy the blessings of God by grace. When we come to church, when we worship God, you know, we don't think, well, what a great heritage I've come from. You know, we are just holy people, you know. In our family, nobody ever went wrong. Not like that. <laughs> we come here humbling ourselves before God and say, it's only by the grace of God we are here. There are so many people out there that don't know God, but it's the grace of God that has brought us here, kept us here. We're enjoying all the blessings of God. Forever we humble ourselves before God and celebrate the grace of God in our lives. God didn't choose us because we were a mighty people and a great people, so wise and so good and all that. God chose us because of his mercy and his grace. There is no boasting in Christianity, you see. 
That's why God chose the younger ones all the time. Out of Cain and Abel, it was Abel. Out of Ishmael and Isaac, it was Isaac. Out of Esau and Jacob, it was Jacob. Out of Manasseh and Ephraim. Now it is Ephraim. It's always like that. Moses was a younger one. Gideon was a younger one. David was the youngest one. It's always like that. God wants to show that it's grace and never works. It's not by your qualification. It's not by anything great that you have. It is by His grace. So when you say by the grace of God, some people say it without knowing what they're saying. You better understand when you say by the grace of God, I'm well, you're saying. Like Andrew, Andre Crouch sang a song back in those days. It always stays with me. I've quoted it before. He says, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he really cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life for me. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm glad he did. He says, what can I say about this? I, you ask me reason why he loved me, why he gave me so much, why he has blessed me. I really don't know. Therefore, all I can say about this is, I'm so glad that he did this. I don't know why he did it, but I'm so glad he did this. I'll just read one more verse and I'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's a wonderful verse. It illustrates this point very clearly about grace. 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 27, 127. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Why does God choose the foolish when there, is, there are wise? There are people saying, well, I'm very wise. If God comes and has a selection, I'll be truly selected because I got in GRE this much. G mat so much, you know. <laughs> Many wise people are there. But not when it comes to blessings from God, my friend. That will get you admission in college. <laughs> but not when it comes to blessing from God. Listen to this. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Some people say, I'm weak, brother. I'm the weaker section of society, one fellow told me. I belong to the weaker section. Well, God is interested in the weaker section. He is looking for the weaker section. If he can lift, lift the weaker section, people. Because the other greater section is already very proud, you know. You know what my education is. You know what my grandpa was. You know what my four generations, we were Christians and this and that. And we built that church and we did this, we did that. Therefore, we deserve this. God says, no, sorry. It doesn't work like that. The weaker ones. So he leaves out the wise and chooses the foolish. He leaves out the, he leaves, leaves out the uh, mighty and chooses the weak. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. So if you're weak, if you're despised, if you're not so wise, you're selected. Hello? <laughs> If you say, God, I'm weak, <laughs> I'm not so good, I'm not so wise, I'm not so great, I don't know what I can do, I don't know how I'll do it. If you ever call me to do something, I don't know how. I don't have particularly anything great in me. God says, you are selected. Because whatever you need to do, what I called you to do, I can give you, don't worry. Then he says, God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? Why God does like this? Why no wise but fools? Why not the mighty but the weak? <laughs> Why the base things, the despised things? Why? Verse 29, read this, that no flesh should glory in his presence so that there is no glorying when we come in here to worship, there is no glorying in his presence. We are all grace creatures, redeemed by the grace of God, touched by God's grace. It is only the mercy of God, the love and the grace of God that has got us here. We are all equally sinners. We are all equally blessed today because of the grace of God. Look at verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom, from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption 
that as it is written, he glories, let him glory in the Lord. If you're going to boast about anything, boast only in the Lord. It says, amen? amen. You're going to be proud of something? Always be proud of God. God did this for me. God has been so good to me. God has been wonderful to me. God's grace has been so amazing to me. Without God, I would not have done this. Without God, this is not, that's the way we need to talk. Amen? He says, he has become for us wisdom from God. Not my wisdom, he is my wisdom. He has become for us righteousness. Not my righteousness, his righteousness. The righteousness of God is given to me. Not my sanctification, he is my sanctification. Don't talk about your holiness. Talk about he has become your sanctification. Not my redemption, my clever cleverness did not redeem me. His redemption. Amen? Joseph, Jacob displayed faith in God because he understood the grace of God. Grace gives and faith takes. The two go together. <laughs> If grace didn't give anything, no use of having faith. What are you going to take? If you had all the faith and grace didn't give anything, you didn't have enough, anything to take. Grace gives and faith takes. Jacob understands perfectly what grace has given. Grace is selection. And he understands perfectly how I must exercise my faith. I must speak out the blessing. I must declare what God has declared already and possess the blessing. And that is why by faith he blessed. Shall we all stand together? Let's lift up our hands and give thanks to God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. We thank you, Lord, for this day, for the amazing truth concerning faith, O oh God. Thank you for grace has given us everything. Grace has bestowed upon us blessings that are too far beyond us, oh God. Anything that we can ever, beyond anything that we can ever imagine. Much more than what we have asked. You have bestowed upon us. Thank you for your grace. We stand before you just like Jacob. We are transformed by your power. We bring nothing in, but you give us everything. You make all things possible. <clears throat> Our life is in your hands. Help us to believe the grace of God, what it has given. Help us to speak out and declare and confess by faith what God has given to us. And stand on faith on those things that God has declared as ours, just like Jacob. I pray that the blessings of God will rest and abide upon the people, O oh God. That they will experience your grace and your faith every day in their life. In an amazing way as they hear these truths, O oh God. Let these things become a reality. Let the walk of faith become a reality for them. Let them see that they're walking just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is ours. He's still doing great things, amazing things in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore. Amen.